Okay, all right. So here we're gonna continue with the optimal power flow problem. So in general, the problem looks something like this, minimize cost subject to the power on each of the bus is bounded between the maximum and the minimum and the flow on each of the lines is bounded between the maximum and the minimum. So in general, this type of problems are solved on computer, right? So for this class, we're gonna look at example problems where you can solve by guess, right? So basically the idea is first, solve the problem Without constraints, then check which of the constraints are violated. And then last, what you do is you sort of then you guess. which one would be tight, right? So you guess which one would, which, what, which constraint would be binding or tight. And then, so you set the binding constraint from inequality to equality, and then you solve the problem. Okay, so we're gonna see some examples of this here. And the idea really is that uh, so you can solve this problem, but uh, the idea is to show you some of the counterintuitive flows that can happen. So this kind of flows can get especially uh, strange or unexpected if you type you, if you have this type of flow constraint in the problem. Okay, and this largely comes because of uh, Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's curve. because of Kirchhoff's voltage law that constrains how power flows in the system. So here, let's first look at a problem, three bus problem. So three bus is about as large as the problem we'll see in this class. And sometimes we'll have two generators. Right? We'll have two generators together at one bus. So in this case, for example, A and B, together here at one bus. Okay. So normally these two generators will be have different capacities. Right, so there's an the idea of you know which generator do you use first, which generator do you use second, and so on. Okay, so here in this problem, we have four generators, three buses, lines with different reactants. So this reactant is 0.2, this is 0.2, and this is 0.1 reactants in per unit. And you're asking to satisfy a load of 50, 360. Okay. So again, the first step is to check this problem is feasible, right? So the sum of the load, in this case, needs to be less than or equal to sum of all the capacities in the system, right? So the problem is feasible only if this is true. Actually, in this case, this inequality holds, so this is a feasible problem. And the goal is to find the least cost solution of satisfying this load. And so what you do is first you solve a command dispatch. So this means no constraint whatsoever. And then you try to figure out how much, then you try to see whether some constraints are violated or not. Okay, so here is solve where you ignore all the constraints. Okay, so we ignore all the constraints in the problem and uh, let's see what we get. Okay, so if you ignore all the constraints, basically you just go from the cheapest generator to the most expensive ones, right? So if you look at this, B is the cheapest, followed by A, followed by D, followed by C. Okay, so there's an order of uh, how expensive they are. So in this case, you use all B, you go up to 285. Use all B because that's the cheapest generator. The next cheapest is A, and use A to generate rest of the 
uh, you satisfy the rest of the demand, and that turns out to be 125, 125 megawatt. So C is zero megawatts, D is zero megawatts, right? So they don't supply any power here. So you're right. So now, so we have a situation where bus one is injecting 360 megawatt into the system. Bus two has a load of 60. Bus three has a load. <coughs> bus three has a load of 300. So you look at the superposition of the flows and see how much is, right? So you look at how much power is flowing on each line. So here, what you do is, since you have two loads with drawing power, so we can separate out the two flows in two situations. So the first one will be the flow from one to three. Okay, so in, in this case, you only look at the load that being satisfied at three. So this is 300 megawatts flowing to 300 megawatt at three. Then you add this to a case where you have 60 flowing down here to 60, right? So you can separate out each of the load in the system. So in this case, the power will go this way. In this case, power will go this way, right? And we can compute each of the flows and then we add them back together to get what the final thing looks like, to get what the final solution is. So if you do this computation, if you add, compute the flows on each of the cases and you add them together, you get the following flow diagram. Basically, you get 156 is on this line, 204 is on this line, and 96 megawatt is on this line. All right. So this is the flow you have in the system. If you ignore all the generation capacity, if you ignore all the line flow capacities. So, so here, when you solve, so basically for this economic dispatch, you will ignore all the line flow capacity, all the line capacities. You solve it, but you have, well, uh, respecting the generator capacity. So you ignore all the line flow capacity, and this is what you get uh, if you ignore all the line flow capacity. So this is not feasible, right? This is not a feasible solution because the line capacity from one to two is 126. Here you have 156. So this is not feasible. You're generating, you're flowing too much power on this line. So we need to correct for this flow, right? We need to reduce this flow, okay? And uh, so how do we correct this flow? Well, now you look at so you have two choices, basically, right? So you have two choices because you cannot generate more as generator A. So you have to either generate a generator C or generator D. So you look at the cost, right? So C is, right? So you look at whether you can generate C or generate D. And then if you generate a D, it doesn't help you. Because if you generate a D, so if you look at this branch, right? So let's see. If you generate more power here, if you increase this power flow, what happens is right. So here, let's see, right? So here you have two choices, right? So again, we have two, actually we have two choices. So we have we can generate either a C or a D. So the idea is let's try both. Okay, so we want to read, so we cannot generate more at A because we're already uh, over capacity on this line. Here, C is generating zero, D is generating zero. So let's try to see what happens if you try to generate more at D, right? If we have generator C and what you happens when you try to generate more at generator D. And then C1, whether you can correct for this overflow, and two, what is the cost? So let's see now if I, Basically, your goal is to check what happens if you start generator at, gen at bus two. So you push one megawatt into bus two, 
And then what happens is this one megawatt, right? Breaks up into two paths. So some goes here, another goes here. So if you look at the reactants on this line, this is point two reactants. On this path from two to three and three to one, this reactance is 0.3. Okay, so one megawatt of power flow divides into the following, right? So on this line, you have 0 0.3, 0 0.2 plus 0 0.3 times one, this is 0 0.6 megawatts. And then here you flow the rest, 0 0.4 megawatts. Okay, right, so this is how the flow divides up. So here, let's see how much we have to cancel, right? So we have to, cancel some lines, right? So this is our solution from the first part, from our first solution here. We know this thing is, we know this one is flowing too much power. So I want to cancel this out, right? So the way of canceling this out is basically what you do for cancel this out as you want to end up with a flow of only 126 because that's your line capacity. So now we have to determine how much is a backflow on the line. Right? So to cancel this 30 megawatts, basically I want to flow 30 megawatts here, right? So 150 minus 30 is 126. If this flow 30, then this thing has to flow 20, 20 megawatts. So what you have to do is inject 50 megawatts here you take out 50 megawatt, and then this is the 20 megawatts here. So these two added together give you the final solution like this. Okay, so of course this 20 megawatts get added to here as well. This 20 max flowing cancels out some of the 204. So you end up with 126, 116, and 184 megawatt on the line flows. So this is one plausible solution. This is one plausible solution, right? So it, uh, okay, so what happens is you use some you use generator C to generate some power, right? So this may this is a feasible solution, but uh, this may not be a for optimal solution. So let's check another possibility as instead of using C, you start using D and see what happens here, okay? So here, same thing. You're pushing min one megawatt in here, then the flow divides into 0.6 megawatt. So here, divide, here is 0.4. Okay, so superposition again, we want to cancel out this flow, right? I want to get 30, cancel 30 out of that flow. So let's see how much this bus has to go in, right? So here we want the flow to be 30. Then the flow this way, right? So this is 30. The flow this way has to be 45 because the way power divides. So in together, you need to inject 75 megawatt into here and take out 75 megawatt out of this bus, okay? So the final result is basically you have, uh, right? So you're generating less from one, you're generating less from uh, generator A and B from bus one because you're generating more from the other generators, okay? So now we can compare the uh, different costs, right? So for the first cost, we have, So compute the first generating cost. What we have is you have you use all of B. So this is to get this one, you have 285 multiplied by six plus the rest you need for economic dispatch is 125. 125 multiplied by 7.5, right? So this is how you compute this solution. So for dispatch two, the way you compute it is go look at this, right? So here, what is going on is you're injecting, right? So 310 megawatts into this bus. So to inject 310 into this, so actually let's look at this more closely for uh, 
cause of dispatch. Okay, so let's look at it more closely. So you look at the cost of dispatch two, right? For the second uh, solution we have, which are you use generator C for dispatch. So what you have is you have the following. Right, so 310 goes in here, 10 go flows in there, and then 300 comes out here. And then if you look at the generator and load in this bus, right, basically you have generator A, you have generator B, here you have generator C, you have generator D, and you have a load, right? So the load we have in the system is right, so here we have 50 megawatt load. Here we have 60 megawatt. Here we have 300. Okay, so A and B together is flowing 310 into the system, right? So we need to look at how much A and B is generating in this case, right? So so the total generation of A and B right so the total generation A and B is 310 the power is injecting into the rest of the network plus 50 is own load 360 megawatt. Okay, so this is the power into the network. This is load at bus one. Okay, so together there are 360 megawatts. So out of the 360, you use the cheapest generator first, right? So B. Because this is the cheapest generator, so this thing generates to its capacity 285 megawatts. Then generator A generates the leftover, so 360 minus 285. This is 75 megawatts. Okay, right? So this is how much it generates. Then if you look at the other bus, right? So you look at the generation. of C, right? So how much does this thing generate? Well, it uh, has a power injection of minus 10, okay? So 10 is coming to C, so this is minus 10. Its own load is 60 megawatts, so this is 50 megawatts. Its own total generation, right? So this is, so the total cost in this case will be Two eighty five multiplied by six plus seventy five multiplied by seven point five plus fifty multiplied by fourteen, and that's what gives you this number. And right, so that's what gives you this two nine seven two point five. Dollar per hour. Okay, so this is how you compete, right? So to figure out the generation at each node, you have to consider both the flow that going into the network and the load at that bus itself. Okay, so you have to consider both of these together to figure out what the generation is. So let's do this again for the next example, right? So for the cost of dispatch three. Okay, so cost of dispatch three, if you look at the power flow into it, this is, for this case, we have 285, 60, 225. Okay, and uh, if you look at the Generation and load, again, this is A, B, 
50 here, 60 here, C, 300 megawatt load, and D as a generation. Okay, so you have a look at the total generation at bus one. All right, so this is A and B together. So this is 285, how much going to the network plus the own load, so 335 megawatts. And out of this, again, you use the cheapest one first, right? So you use the generated B first because it's cheaper. So this is 285 from B and the rest 50 from A. You look at the total generation of bus two, This says you're getting 60 from the network, so it's minus 60. Your own load is 60 as well, so this time is zero, so nothing happens. Or there's zero generation at the uh, bus two. And you look at this as bus three, we have as you have your flow into the network 225, you're getting 225 megawatt. Or your load is 300, right? So your load is 300, so you add this, means you're generating 75 megawatts, so the total cost is 285 times six plus 50 times 7.5 plus 75 times 10. And together, this gives you 2835. Dollar per hour. So that's your total cost, right? So the one you end up picking, uh, this one, right? So this is the one that's, uh, so this one's not good because this one's not feasible, right? It doesn't satisfy the flow constraints. This one is too expensive or too costly. This one is a least cost feasible solution. Okay, so you want to pick this one. And the difference between the two, right? So 2835 minus 647.5, 187. So you get this 187 dollar per hour. So this thing is called the cost of security. So this is just a fancy name of saying, because you have constraints, the cost is more, it costs more because you have constraints in the system. All right, so this is the way you compute this kind of three bus systems. And then the third dispatch, right? So the last one is the, is the one we will pick, right? So this is dispatch three from above. This is the least cost solution. And this is the one ISO will implement, right? So this tells you how much Generation, right? How much should each node generate? So of course this is not right. So of course we also care about computing the price, right? So we always care both of you know how much you should generate and what is the price at each node. Sometimes for the price is uh, more important, right? So sometimes price is more important than how much you should generate, right? So remember the nodal price, know the definition of nodal price. You can take this to be nodal price as the additional cost of supplying one megawatt of load at a bus. Okay, so this one megawatt is because this is easy to normalize. Okay, we want a, something unit of dollar per megawatt. So we we'll take one megawatt. Really, this is the cost of supplying a epsilon. So very, very small amount of additional load at the bus, right? So, you know, for simplicity, we just think of this as, you know, what happens if you need one megawatt or one megawatt hour of load here. So this is defined as the optimal power flow solution. Okay, so to compute this, you need to solve OPF first. 
because this tells you what the current solution is. And then based on that, you compute what the power, based, based on that, you compute the power flow solution, basically you compute the nodal price. Okay, so for the nodal price, at uh, bus A, let's look at what happens. Okay, so bus A means, let's say I add a little bit low, my megawatt here, how much money, right? What is the cost of supplying this? So for this load, right, for this one megawatt, I cannot use the cheapest generator, I cannot use B, because B is already supplying 25. But I could use A, right? So I could use, well, this is use generator A. So here the nodal price is $7.5 per megawatt hour. Okay, so if I use one more megawatt here, I just use A, and that's the cheapest generator. And so it's a bit more interesting now if you look at uh, what happens, let's see, at uh, node three, right? So let's say what happens if you focus on this node three. So I add a little bit one more megawatt of generator here. Okay, so how much, you know, where should I, I get power from? So here the issue is that if you look at the cheapest generator B, you cannot use B because B is a capacity. Now next you look at the next cheapest generator A. Can you use generator A? You cannot use generator A because if generator A generates more power, some of it has to go on this line, right? So that's, that will violate the line constraint. So A cannot generate anything for this additional one megawatt. So you end up has to pick D, right? So you want to use generator D, the third cheapest generator. So the nodal price here is $10 per megawatt hour. Okay. So then now you look at what happens plus two, right? So if I increase one more, one megawatt right, of load here, what happens here, right? So where does the power have to come from? Right, so the idea first of this is, well, we don't want to use D, don't want to use generator C. Okay, we don't want to use this generator, it's too expensive. But then if I increase A, it seems that I, over, I would overload a lot, right? So what do I do in this case, right? Is there a way to get power to bus two without over without overloading this line. So the idea of getting this power is the following. It's basically, if you, it is true, right? If you put in one megawatt here, there'll be some flow along this line, right? If you put in another megawatt here, it will be flow along that line. Okay, so the question is how do you Right, so how do you get this to cancel out? So the idea is basically you want to remove power here. And what you do here is you want to inject more, right? So it's not using one, it's to increase power at bus two. Bus one has to send in less power to not overload the line. This frees up some room for bus two, for bus three, for generator D, to send power to bus two. Okay, so that's that's the idea what we have, right? So what we want is, we don't want to change the power flow on this line. Okay, so now we want to know how much power do I have to put in here? How much power do I have to take out here such that the sum total is one megawatt? Okay, and uh, basically this will be a negative number. Okay, so this will be a negative number. So to solve for this, what we have is we have right, delta P1 plus delta P3 equal to one megawatt. This is the amount of power we want. Then, so this line, basically this is 0. 0.6 delta P1 plus 0. 0.2 delta P2 equal to zero. This has a total flow, right? So this is delta F12 has to be zero. We don't want to overload the line. We don't want to change the flow on this line. 
Okay, so this has two equations in two unknowns in delta P1, delta P3. You can solve these. What you get is delta P1 is 0.5 megawatt, delta P2 is 1.5 megawatt. And the cost is the following, right? The nodal price at two is 1.5 times the cost at bar three. So this is the generator D. So this is 10 minus 0 0.5 times 7.5, right? So this is generator D, this is generator B. Because you're producing less power, and one will know, this is $11.25 per megawatt hour. And this, if you compare with the, just using uh, generator C, this is still cheaper than just using generator C. Okay, so there's a mixture of the uh, nodal price. Okay, so here what you have is you have both the generator A and the generator, sorry, this is using generator A, not generator B. So generator B has capacity, gener generator A has some capacity left. So you have generated A and generator D are both marginal generators, right? They will supply the next megawatt of load wherever they come from. Generator B and generator C are not marginal. Right, so C is not used, B is a capacity. But the general idea is in your unconstrained system, there's one marginal generator, but in a constrained system, there'll be more than one generator. So in general, there's a rule for this. This is, there's M binding constraints. That will be M plus one marginal generators. So unconstrained means zero, by right? binding constraints, you have one marginal generator. Here we have one line binding, you have two marginal generators. And we have uh, the prices can be linear combination. of different generators. Okay, so it doesn't have to be the price coming from one generator, it could be a linear combination. So you can put everything together and compute the surplus, right? Or in total in the system, and compute the consumption, the production, the payment, and so on. This way you get a surplus. And uh, in those kind of situations, you have some sort of very counterintuitive flows, right? So you have a flow going from bus two to bus three, where bus two is more, good, more expensive than bus three. Okay? So you do have flows from the more costly buses to the less costly buses. Okay? So this is you know, one the feature of the power system. Right? So it's not you know, always uh, the power will flow from cheaper to more expensive buses, right? So, it does happen quite often that uh, you know you need to buy power, you need to get some power from a more expensive bus, right? So the reason is uh, power flow again goes everywhere. You cannot route power flow, so this kind of counterintuitive flow does happen. Okay? And uh, even you can have nodal price as negative. It also could happen that uh, you have negative nodal prices, which is not again not uncommon. Okay, so and then this basically, what happens is you can get interesting market power opportunities here, okay? So let's see C really, really wants to produce some power. Okay, let's see C really wants to produce some power, wants to get, to, get, get into this action. So what it does is base a very low cost, right? It pays a very low price into the system. So it will get dispatched. Okay, so let's say C really wants to be in there, will get dispatched. So this C becomes the cheapest generator. Okay, so let's see whether C has a reason to do this or not. Okay, so if C does this, then what happens is basically you have okay, so if C bits like this, what you have is 
you have the dispatch of B, right? C will be used, B will be used, A will be used a little bit, and for the unconstrained dispatch. So if you put in a constrained dispatch and you compute the uh, flows, basically you get the following flow. C will generate a little bit of power, B will also generate a lot, A will generate some, B will generate some, and this is the binding flow. Okay. Here you have the flow binding. So what happened here is basically, if you look at the nodal prices compared to before, as you reduce the price here, because now C is a marginal generator, so C with price at two has reduced, price at three has increased, right? Has increased quite a bit. And what happened is generator D is generating a lot. It's generating more at a higher price. Okay, and here what that then the line is constructed. So because this, right, so what D can do is D observes this line is tend to be binding and D can increase its price. So D, for example, can increase it to $20 per megawatt hour. Okay. Because of constraint on this line, D can pretty much inject whatever it, wa whatever it wants at this bus. Because this line will always be binding Right? So there's cheaper power coming from other places. So this one will always be binding. But if D increases cost, increases bid, the uh, price keeps going up and D can you know, make uh, whatever profit wants. Okay, so D can increase its profit by quite a bit if generator C cooperates and uh, gets, uh, you know, gets one of the lines to be binding. Okay? So, you know, this could happen in practice. If you have a line that has very little capacity, that tend to bind all the time, right? So this is not, you know, again, at the same time, not all, not all that easy to discover whether this line is binding or not. So that's something that, you know, market operators does look out for. They will look out for this kind of uh, binding constraints. They will check whether now there might be collusion or not in the system. Okay. So the last thing here we'll do is look at something called the financial transmission right. Okay, so financial transmission right basically saying that, you know, this kind of nodal prices can change quite a bit depending on how people bid. So you want to manage the risk in this kind of bidding a little bit. Okay, so, you want to uh, hedge this a little bit to say that I can buy some transmission ahead of time. And so I'm not for always forced into a situation where I have to uh, sort of, where I have to you know, be at mercy of a binding line and some, you know, some producer increasing his cost. Okay, so what you do is you basically you can allow to enter something to buy bilateral contracts. So you figure out, you know, you come to your own agreement of how much you want to buy, how much you want to sell, at whatever cost, and then you contract the difference that happened on the transmission line. Okay, so what could happen is let's say you have two generate, you have two areas. They agree that uh, the one generator will sell to the other area at the quantity of 40 at the, for 400 megawatt of power at the price of $30 per megawatt hour, okay, through some transmission line. So then if you look at uh, the case that there is no, let's say, you know, other people using the line, but not too many people use this, so they're not, so the line is not binding. And you get a situation where the market price is less than 30, right? So if the market price is less than 30, what they agreed upon. So basically what happens is they will, they will complete the transaction at $30 per megawatt hour. Okay, so it, they would, even though the marginal price is lower, 
they have agreed for it to be $30 per megawatt hour, they will just stick with this price. Okay, they won't change this price. Right, and then if there's a congestion, for example, so now let's look at what happens when there's congestion. Let's say now, suppose we have congestion, but they already agreed on a cost, right? So what happens is this 400, okay, so what happens here is this power plant, this, this thing buys power, B buys power, and $19 per megawatt hour. Okay, so what's the total, right? So this is, sorry, B sells power. What happens is B sells power at uh, I-19, right? So expect 30. So, right, so here is supposed to, right? So S supposed to pay B. Pay the cost difference, 400 times 30 minus 19. Zero dollars. Okay, so right, so this is, right, so you sell the nodal price came to 19, but we agree that 30, so I, you know, as supposed to pay B. But here, I spice power at 35, but suppose to buy at 30, so B has to pay us 400, 35 minus 30, right? So it's too expensive, right? We had a contract at 30. So the difference should be made up by the seller. So here actually there is a shortfall. Right, so both sides are expect each other to pay them money, right? To make up for the difference from their contract agreement. Right, so this is obviously not a possible situation, right? They cannot, you know, pay each other, right? So they, they all expect money from the other party, right? So this is the reason, you know, the reason this happens is because of congestion, right? So congestion uh, sort of messes up the nodal price and create a difference in nodal price. And this will, you know, can potentially create shortfall. Or you know, both parties are not happy, right? You can you know, the seller cannot get power across, the buyer cannot have access to a cheaper source of power. Okay, so financial transmission rights is basically that uh, you hedge for this situation by buying some of the trans by reserving some of the transmission rights. Okay, so you reserve that uh, you know some part of this line can only be used by you. Okay, so in this case is that, uh, right, so because you have, for, you want to send 400 megawatt over, you just buy 400 megawatt of the transmission line. Because you bought it, then as long as, you know, it doesn't matter what other people do, 400 of this is reserved for you, then you can always break even, right? So even if there's sort of a gap, as what happens is 400 of megawatt, of transmission is sort of guaranteed by the system operator. So as provided by the system operator, so in this case, the system operator provides this for you and uh, the shortfall comes from the system operator. Or that the because you pay for this right, right? So you pay some money for using the transmission, then the, this is paid back to you if there is a shortfall, if if there's congestion. Right? So if there's no congestion, then so you pay some extra money. If there is congestion, you have hedged for the shortfall to happen. Okay. So this is basically as the auction in the market that like you buy, you know, the right of way, and uh, you buy this kind of point to point financial transmission rights. Okay, so this happens uh, quite a bit. 
the actual market, and financial transmission right is its own third market. So we won't go too deep into the uh, financial transmission rights. This is normally calculated automatically. If we do more optimization problem, cover more optimization, there's an easy way to calculate that. But given the sort of the trial and error procedure we have, we won't go deeper. But just remember that you know if there are flow constraints, uh, everything gets sort of more complicated. There could be very counterintuitive flows, and the transmission rights is something you can buy to hedge for this to happen. 